Um, there we are. Okay, so this is um, a peculiar lecture in that the person I wrote it for was myself. And uh, the reason I wrote it is that I was never entirely comfortable in 20 years of doing spin dynamics with the introductions and the explanations that were there in the undergraduate textbooks. And uh, to my dismay, I realized that all our magnetic resonance textbooks, they simply dodged the question and started with the spin Hamiltonian. And so uh, at some point I locked myself up in the library and proceeded to derive the whole thing from cogito ergo sum, as you shall see to Pauli Hamiltonian. Now, interestingly, there was one category of people who, when I talked to them, were not at all surprised about um, spin. Uh, those were astronomers. And they said, well, hmm, okay, I mean, the body is rotating, so what? And uh, to them, the quantity is unremarkable. If you have a spherical mass that's orbiting some planet, spin is simply its own rotation. And if you look at the equations of motion here, uh, d momentum by dt is just a gravitational force and an external force that you have on the particle. And then d spin by dt is this vector cross product. In fact, in Newtonian gravity, this doesn't exist, but uh, in general and special relativity, it does. You have a precession of the direction of spin for a macroscopic object in an orbit around a massive body. And uh, then uh, there's a force called Thomas uh, force, uh, then uh, lens turing effect uh, discovered in 1918. And if you look at it, this looks like angular momentum. Uh, and uh, it gets crossed with spin. So this is actually the astronomical spin orbit coupling here. Uh, and there's also a spin-spin coupling. That is the interaction between the rotation of the planet and the rotation of the body that's orbiting it due to relativistic frame dragging. Uh, and Thomas precession is a special relativity effect and these two are general relativity effects. And they're all rather weak. You can see they all have c squared in the denominator. So astronomers are not at all surprised and you can see the time scale of this is about right. In 1926, Uhlenbeck and Goodsmith got hold of extremely high quality hydrogen spectrum and they saw that there were additional splittings in it that could not have been explained by Schrodinger's equation at the time. Uh, and they did what you'd expect naturally uh, people to do. They looked around, they saw, well, okay, um, there's this spin orbit coupling that looks like it fits the bill. So just uh, times uh, L by S, plunk the coefficient in front of it, put it all into the Hamiltonian and it all fitted in a lovely way. And so um, without much ado, they published it, uh, although they were rather bemused at the time. Um, as to first of all the ease with which it all just clicked in and secondly uh, about what it can possibly mean. Uh, now this was not surprising to astronomers but it was very surprising to physicists because of course this all comes from the curvature of space-time by gravitation and electromagnetic fields do not curve space-time and so why the thing should be a copy of that wasn't entirely clear. Another objection from Pauli was that the canonical quantization procedure implies that all the operators in the Schrodinger picture are either multiplicative or differential and such operators cannot possibly have exactly two eigenvalues. They can either have infinitely many or they can have none if the equation is not soluble. It is not possible for a differential or a multiplicative operator in a Hilbert space to have exactly two eigenvalues. So that was a bit of a mystery. Lorentz estimated the surface velocities that a charged particle would have to have in order to have that magnetic moment for a classical electron radius and concluded that it would have to spin at 10 times the speed of light, uh, which was also not terribly uh, good news. And then, of course, exactly two eigenstates. Uh, and if you look at angular momentum, you can either have one for s orbital or three for p orbital or five for d orbital. They're odd numbers. There was no way to squeeze an even dimensional representation into the theory of angular momentum. Certainly nothing that's two by two. And then if you try actually squeezing it into a three-dimensional rotation group, you get a lot of bizarre things like four pi periodic rotation. And this is just reductio ad absurdum, right? So it was clear that something very strange was going on. And then Heisenberg, 
uh, read the paper, uh, and of course, Ullenbeck and Goodsmith simply had a coefficient to fit, so they didn't notice it. But he noticed that the classical description that they use actually is missing a factor of two. So he wrote a letter uh, to Goodsmith uh, calling his paper Seine Mutige Note, your brave note, and asked him quite politely, what has he done with a factor of two? Well, Goodsmith was 24 at the time. He was more or less a PhD student, uh, and he admits quite frankly in his memoirs that he was completely overwhelmed and didn't understand a bit of it. So the paper essentially uh, was a product of much courage, much luck, uh, and the hydrogen spectrum that was measured by Sommerfeld. Now, of course, everybody was rather suspicious about a property that on the one hand you essentially need, but on the other that doesn't seem to have any good explanation for it. Uh, and uh, Ullenbeck in his memoirs is quite fond of this particular letter. It's from Llewellyn Thomas, a British specialist in relativity to Goodsmith. Uh, 1926, same year as the paper was published. I, I don't think how, I know how well it comes on, on your screen, so I'll read it. I think you and Ullenbeck have been very lucky to get your spinning electron published and talked about before Pauli heard of it. It appears that more than a year ago, Kronig, an American physicist, believed in the spinning electron and worked out something. The first person he showed it to was Pauli. Pauli ridiculed the whole thing so much that the first person also became the last and no one else heard anything of it. Which all goes to show that the infallibility of the deity does not extend to his self-styled vicar on earth, meaning Pauli, of course. And then there's a little bit of nitty gritty here and he writes, at present, I'm still working on a longer article on the kinematics of the rotating electron. So they really believed at the time that the thing was physically spinning. And then, of course, plenty of contradictions arose uh, from Lawrence. Uh, he wrote uh, to Goodsmith, uh, that is very difficult because it causes the self-energy of the electron to be wrong. Aaron Fest, well, that's a nice idea, though it may be wrong, but you don't have a reputation yet, so you have nothing to lose. A lot of encouragement, right? Remember, Goodsmith was uh, 24. Niels Bohr, on your way home, you should stop off at Hamburg and explain the factor of two to Pauli. No pressure, dude. Anyway, the factor of two was eventually found. Thomas found it, but everyone was intensely uncomfortable with the picture. On the one hand, it was unavoidable that you should have something like uh, what they suggested. On the other, there was no good explanation for it. Dirac produced uh, an interesting contribution at the time he basically reverse engineered the relativistic energy equation. So he took this uh, from Einstein, so E squared, M squared, C four, C squared, P squared. This is uh, from special relativity and said, well, why don't we just quantize it like we usually do? If this en energy squared, then that's the Hamiltonian squared. If that's momentum, we must have a momentum operator in here. So essentially uh, a bit of a hack. And then he said, okay, but we actually want the Hamiltonian itself rather than the square. And if the square um, depends on the square of the momentum, then let's assume that the Hamiltonian itself is linear in momentum. So he put four coefficients in front of the four terms that he had there and just squared it and demanded that he find such coefficient that have coefficients that make the result equal to this. It quickly turned out that such coefficients do not exist, at least when they're scalars. Dirac said, well, okay, scalars don't exist. Let's make them matrices. And um, it turned out that uh, many such matrices exist. Uh, the smallest dimension uh, that uh, fits is four by four. And uh, Pauli matrices turned up in the blocks of those uh, matrices that necessarily had to be here in order for this to be equal to this. Now, Amazingly, the resulting equation predicted absolutely everything that was known or measured about the electron at the time, including spin. However, as Dirac himself admitted, that was a dubious hack, essentially abuse of notation. Uh, and uh, it did predict everything, but it explained absolutely nothing. I mean, goodness knows where these Pauli matrices are coming from, why they should be there, and what on earth is this negative energy here? And that later turned out to do with um, the antimatter, but at the time it was much, much later. Anyway, so Dirac produced a, a mysterious equation that 
fitted everything and explained nothing. And it wasn't until Wigner published his book in 1931 that a neat derivation uh, from the beginning to the end became available. Wigner started from basic symmetries. He used group theory to find the group invariants of those symmetries, and then he turned those invariants into the equations of motion. So what we will now do is follow Wigner's path through those basic symmetries, and eventually we will derive spin. Okay, so we will start at the very, very beginning. We will assume that reality is knowable. Uh, and that means that for any finite physical system, there must exist the possibility of describing it. That is, there must be a descriptor, not necessarily a wave function. Uh, in fact, it isn't, but a possibility of describing your finite system. We will also assume that reality has rules. That is, if system had a certain state at a particular time, that there should be an operator that takes it forward to the next time. And these are the rules. We don't know what they are, but we assume that they exist. We will also assume that time is uniform. That is, these rules do not depend on the absolute time. They only depend on the increment. That is the difference between t and t prime. We'll call it tau, so we have a u of tau. So if we had a descriptor at a time t and an evolution for a time tau, we will have a descriptor at t plus tau. And then, of course, the superposition of these operators is another such operator. They're called propagators. Information cannot be lost, so for every propagator there must be an inverse. There's a unit propagator that does nothing, and that is the list of properties required of a group. So we actually have a propagator group. Okay, the next assumption is that reality is continuous. And of course, velocities and accelerations are aspects of that reality. So they themselves must be continuous. And so every derivative must exist. As soon as it does, we can have a Taylor series. So we can take this Psi t plus tau and expand it in a Taylor series using the derivatives of Psi. But if we put the Taylor series into a square bracket, what you would realize that this is in fact an exponential of the differentiation operator. And so interestingly, without too many assumptions, we actually found an explicit expression for the propagator. It is an exponential of a time derivative. And in general, the exponential of a derivative is a finite shift. So this is why it shifts uh, the things forward. This operator here is called the time evolution generator. And one, why don't we take a better look at it? Well, we can find its eigensystem, right? Mathematics is independent on rea of reality being there or not. It's a logical construct. And we know perfectly well that the eigenfunction of a, of a derivative is an exponential. And so if we were to look for a matrix representation of this operator, it would simply be a product by omega. And since it's one dimensional, it's an irreducible representation. And then if we were to look for an arbitrary representation, we know from group series that it's a direct sum of irreducible ones. And so uh, in any representation of physical reality, the generator must have this form. Operators in a group representations are defined up to a similarity transform. So these are in fact in general Hermitian matrices. And so it turns out that actually the evolution equation must look like this. D by dt is minus i times some matrix. And we didn't have to make too many assumptions for this. In essence, uh, in any knowable and continuous reality with unchanging rules, the equation of motion must have this form uh, and any representation of reality must evolve under the corresponding representation of the, the propagator group. Okay, so we have got quite far from quite a few simple assumptions. Let us now look at other symmetries of reality. Rotations. Again, rotations are a continuous group. One rotation times another is another rotation. This is called closure. There's a unit element that does nothing. And for every rotation, there is an inverse one. And it's the same uh, game, right? So the exponential of a derivative is an increment. So x d by d phi is just shifting f. So that must be the rotation operator. This is it. And if we go through the chain rule and express it in Cartesian coordinates, you will see the operators that we know from classical physics are angular momentum operators. So it turns out that angular momentum operators are generators of the rotation group. And you have the usual commutation relations for them. 
Now, uh, the general rotation is then the exponential of um, the three generators. This nx and ynz is the vector uh, around which we are rotating and alpha is the angle. Now, since the content of this slide is so familiar to everybody present, you have all done angular momentum, I will use it to introduce the somewhat more general group theory. Now, notice what we have here. We have a linear combination. Once we have linear combinations, this is a space. And once we introduce commutators, the resulting object in mathematics is called an algebra. It's a space with a commutator. And then these operators uh, that whose combinations span the algebra are called the generators. Then this is the exponential map that gets us into the group where the rotations themselves live. And that's an element of that group. And these are the group parameters. And so rotation group is a triparametric group, three Euler angles, for example, that is generated by the angular momentum operators. And these um, commutation relations are called structure relations of the algebra. Now, one thing that you also know about is for angular momenta, we have an operator that commutes with everything. Uh, this is general. Uh, the algebra of every continuous group has such operators. They're called Casimir operators. And their function is, in fact, to commute with everything. They also enumerate irreducible representations. They are multiples of unit matrices in a reps, and they correspond to conserved quantities. So the total angular momentum is in fact conserved. And the ultimate, the fundamental assumption that we have made here is that reality is isotropic, right? If you rotate the coordinate system and repeat the experiment, you are guaranteed the same outcome up to that rotation. And so orbital angular momentum A exists and B is conserved just because reality is isotropic. Everything else is unavoidable mathematics. Translations. We know that we can translate things in x, y, and z, and also in time. And so that's the translation group where this little coefficient c has to be here to have consistent units, right? Time has a dimension of time. So this has to have a dimension of velocity for the result to have a dimension of coordinates and everything uh, for everything to be internally consistent. Uh, the same thing, right? A linear combination of these generators then gets exponentiated and produces a general translation. And these are the parameters of the translation group C, T, X, Y, and Z. And the Casimir operator here is this uh, in the relativistic metric. Uh, it's, it's too far in the mathematics. I would uh, skip uh, the reason why these minuses are here. But let's take a look at this. The Translation operator with respect to time, d by dt, remember a few slides back it was the Hamiltonian, it was essentially energy. All right here we have the momentum squared, and so we have a relationship here between energy and momentum. Well, the corresponding coefficient has to have something to do with mass, uh, because, well, that's the relationship between energy and momentum. And if we look hypothetically at something that doesn't have a mass, let's put this to zero, then we have this relation and we can replace these things with their differential operators. We get this equation. This is actually wave equation. And we know exactly what this C actually means. It's the velocity of propagation for whatever this wave equation describes. So because we assume zero mass, this is propagation velocity for massless waves it has to be the speed of light. So you can see how elementary things come out of basic symmetries. And after you put all the correct units in here, uh, you get the relativistic energy momentum relation, right? E squared is m squared c to the fourth plus c squared p squared. Uh, and remember what we have found out twice by now, that energy is a linear momentum in time. So the consequence of uniformity of reality is the conservation of rest mass and linear momentum, and also the requirement for there to be the speed of light. Before I move further into Lorentz group, uh, I need to introduce a little bit uh, of the things that uh, chemists would not necessarily be familiar with. Uh, Michelson-Morley experiment, long before 
uh, what I was talking about previously. Uh, they were trying to measure uh, the dependence of the speed of light on the reference frame of the Earth relative to some privileged frames that they assumed had existed. And so they measured it in summer and winter when Earth was on a different side of the sun and moving in opposite directions. And to their surprise, they discovered that the speed of light was exactly the same in all reference frames. This is the famous equipment, uh, you know, brickwork, turntable and an enormous slab of concrete with an interferometer on it. So the speed of light was the same in all reference frame, frames, which flew into the face of, uh, for example, the Doppler effect, which was well understood at the time. So Lawrence, uh, who had seen such things before for Maxwell's equations, suggested that the only way to reconcile, assuming you trust the outcome, uh, it weighs uh, what else is observed, is to assume that when an object is moving, it is shrunk in the direction of motion, its time is dilated. And then if you assume that transformation to be a group, uh, that it has to obey the group properties, there's only one transformation that fits the bill, uh, the so-called Lorentz transformation. It compresses the object in the direction of travel and also delays time. Now, Lorentz had already seen this in Maxwell's equations, which are Lorentz invariant, but in this case, the target of the transformation wasn't some wave, it was the actual experimental apparatus, which was a bit shocking uh, at the time. And you can see uh, the word Perzuch uh, in Lorentz's paper, attempt at a theory of electric and optical uh, interactions between bodies. So that was actually an early indication that meta wasn't privileged relative to waves, that you had to apply the same transformations to meta and to waves in order to have consistent physics. Okay, so Lorentz group. So this is the transformation uh, in two dimensions, so time and x in uh, Four dimensions, it would look very, very similar. So just such blocks for all coordinates and this boost. Let us uh, transform it a little bit. Uh, we will put uh, V over C as hyperbolic tangent of this phi, it's called rapidity. Then the expression for the Lorentz boost operator is simplified, it becomes trigonometric. And then it's an exponential of this matrix. And again, you can see the exponential, a generator and a parameter. So we are now speaking once again, group theoretical language. After you do all the chain rules, you arrive at differential expressions for Lorentz boosts. And they're actually quite similar to angular momentum expressions, except there's a plus in here. So it's not a rotation, it's a stretch and squeeze. And there's always time involved. CT, CT, everywhere here, here, and here. Turns out, after you work through the commutators, that boosts are not actually independent from rotations. When you commute two boosts, you get a rotation. So now we have in this Lorentz group, uh, a symmetry group that accounts for special relativity, the usual rotations. You can rotate the body as per the usual, but we also have entirely new kind of rotations. You can rotate the body by giving two sequential Lorentz boosts in two different directions. So in space-time, there are two ways of rotating things. A rotation may also be accomplished by a superposition of boosts. Now, remember how we derived rotations in the rotation group. The invariant, right, the angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum was the consequence of this commutation relation. And now we have different commutation relations, so the invariant is going to change. It is not going to be orbital angular momentum that is going to be conserved, it is going to be something else. And you can now start seeing the glimpses of the new property emerging. In Lorentz group, there are actually two Casimir operators, uh, and this one, look at it, it has the total orbital angular momentum, but also the total boost. So it's not just angular momentum, it is angular momentum and something else. Now, the interesting thing here is, of course, we could have done the same as what we did for spherical harmonics in angular momentum, solve the differential equation, get the eigenfunctions. Uh, but those of you who actually uh, remember how it was derived would remember that the derivation was horrendous. It was actually Laplace uh, who derived it first and he spent like 50 pages of his book doing it. 
Uh, and that was three dimensions. So now we have four dimensions. So um, yes, you can do it. It will take 50 pages of mass. Uh, but thankfully, Wigner found a workaround. He said, why don't we complexify the group? Why don't we take these linear combinations of rotations and boosts and take a look at their commutations? And it turns out that the commutation relations disconnect themselves. So M's only commute between themselves and N's only commute between themselves and they commute with each other. But this we've actually already seen, right? These are exactly the commutation relations of the rotation group, except now we have them twice. Uh, and it needn't actually be the rotation group. If you look into abstract mathematics, there are two groups that fit the bill with respect to the commutation relations. One is SL3, the special orthogonal group in three dimensions, the rotations group. And the other is SU2, the group of all unitary transformations of a two-dimensional complex space. So this is uh, pretty clear and this is quite abstract. And if we are honest about it, we have to now find out which ones we have here because we don't know. We now have time that participates in our rotations. Okay, so what do we know about SL3? Well, it's two pi periodic. If you rotate an object in any, around any axis by two pi, the operator is a unit matrix, right? The object doesn't change. And then if you rotate it by four pi, you still get a unit matrix, right? Two pi periodic. This is not the case for SU2. If you do an SU2 transformation uh, by two pi, you get an inversion. And then if you do it by four pi, then you get the identity matrix. So this group is two pi periodic and that group is four pi periodic, but in an abstract complex space. Well, let's find out what the period is of the Lorentz group. So let's take mx for example, and take its exponential. So that's jx, ikx over two, jx and kx commute. So you can split the exponentials up and notice this factor of two here, right? Ijx alpha was two pi periodic. Ijx alpha over two has to be four pi periodic. And the same applies to kx if you do the mass. So this is in fact four pi periodic. And this has nothing to do with three dimensional rotations. The reason is the presence of boosts, which introduce time as a degree of freedom. So there are two instances of SU2 in the Lorentz group uh, and we know the representations of them so we can proceed. Okay, our Lorentz algebra complexification is a direct sum of two instances of SU2. Uh, and for these, we know everything mathematicians told us. So the uh, irreducible representations, because we have two SU2s, we have two quantum numbers, and then a direct product between the corresponding matrices. Um, if we add inversion to the group, it turns out that the boosts change sign under inversion, so that other Casimir operator, which we didn't discuss, us actually gets knocked out and only one Casimir operator remains. And then it turns out inversion also requires us to either have two j's equal or to have this interesting direct sum j1, j2, direct sum j2, j1. And actually if you look at what they physically mean, they correspond to different types of particles and fields. Fermions go one way, bosons go another way, electromagnetic fields go the third way. They are different irreducible representations of the Lorentz group. Okay, for electrons, because of Uhlenbeck and Goodsmith, we know, and also it matches Dirac's equation, there's only one irreducible representation that actually matches experimental observations, and this is this. And you can see Pauli matrices again made an appearance, they fell out of SU2, you can see a direct sum in both cases. These are unit Pauli matrices, so with ones and minus ones. Um, but um, unfortunately, Lorentz group has no time translation generator. It's about rotations and it's about boosts, but it doesn't have the momentum with respect to time. And we need that thing in order to get the equation of motion. Okay, so let us go into now the giant complete symmetry group of reality where we will put all rotations, all the boosts, all the momenta, the time translation generator, and these are all of the associated commutation relations. This group inherits the invariants from its components. It inherits the mass invariant from the translation group, where this, remember, is the second time derivative, so we can now put together an equation of motion. 
And it inherits this invariant from the Lorentz group, uh, where we have the, ang the angular momentum and the boost. Okay, well, we use that irreducible representation which we have found, and we multiply these two invariants just term by term. So this gets multiplied by momentum squared, and that gets multiplied by three quarters, which is incidentally one half times one half plus one. Uh, okay, so we get that. We know the matrices for this, so we substitute the matrices, and we get this. Uh, and now we need to do a little bit of rearrangement, right? These are still the Pauli matrices, so this is four by four. Pauli matrices have this wonderful complicated property. In practice, it means for us that sigma squared p squared is sigma dot p overall squared. So we substitute it in there. And in passing, I will just mention that this Poincaré group classifies systems by only two things, by mass and by something else which we will hope eventually be spin. Okay, so after we use the Pauli matrix relation, we get here. This is uh, minus i d by dt squared, so I will put that in uh, and put the minus in here. And now we have what looks like a lovely equation of motion, except there's a problem. Our analysis of time translation invariants came up with a pretty hard constraint that in any causal reality, the equation of motion must have this form. It must be first order in time. But this thing is second order in time, so we have to do something. Well, actually, matrix square root is a well-defined operation. If you're looking for Hermitian square roots, uh, this is it. That's the square root of that. You just square it and it goes in here. And we put plus or minus in here. And really the difference between plus and minus is a sentimental matter of which direction of time we call positive. We will also add electromagnetic fields. This is how momentum transforms when you add the vector potential uh, and the energy transforms when you add the scalar potential. With all of that in place, d by dt is this lovely matrix and this actually is Dirac's equation. Now derived properly. Now, I already mentioned that Dirac essentially guessed this equation, but ironically, the derivation that uh, Wigner gave is only possible in hindsight. You have to know which direction to turn in all the many junctions that we have passed. I've sort of swept all the complexities under the rug, but it's only when you know the right answer that you are able to derive this. Okay, now we have a problem. Dirac had a problem until antimatter was discovered. We have these enormous negative energies in the system, right? This is 500 uh, kilo electron volts. And then we have some weird coupling in here. Okay, well, let's split it up. Uh, let's have mc squared minus mc squared, so that's the diagonal, and let's have this counter diagonal in a separate matrix. That's a sum, uh, and that's an enormous splitting, uh, and that's some kind of coupling between the positive and the negative subspaces, and that's our uh, generalized momentum operator. Now, what I would like you to do now is to blink and to look at it with the eyes of an NMR spectroscopist. We've actually seen plenty of such equations. Enormous splitting and a tiny coupling. We know exactly in magnetic resonance what to do with such things. We go into the rotating frame. So interaction representation, it's called rigorously. With respect to this splitting, the frequency of this splitting, it actually has a name, it's called the Zeta Bewegung, and its time scale is in zeptoseconds, 10 to the 20s, uh, 10 to the minus 20 seconds, utterly irrelevant on any time scales that we care uh, to worry about in chemistry. Okay, so that's our H0, that's our H1. A lovely, good, old rotating frame approximation. So we go into the interaction representation here and a lovely, good, old average Hamiltonian theory, right? We average this out over the period of zeta bewegung. To zero's order, turns out it's a zero, but to first order, we get something. It's the sigma dot pi times the unit matrix. Now, the lovely thing you see is this was coupling the positive and negative energies, but this does not. So to first order in average Hamiltonian series, the positive and the negative energy subspaces, they stay disconnected. They evolve separately. 
So why don't we take a closer look at this? Okay, so I will remind you that for unit Pauli matrices, we have this relation. So we now have our average Hamiltonian sigma dot pi over 2m, opening this up using this relation, pi dot pi, sigma dot pi, cross pi. This is not a zero because these are not vectors, these are operators. Split it up, that's our usual Schrodinger kinetic energy, and then we have something else in here. Well, let's just open up the cross. Uh, I will remind you what various things are uh, with respect to the vector potential, scalar potential, and what momentum is. So pi cross pi is p cross p, then p cross a, a cross p, and then a cross a. Now that's actually zero because these things commute with each other. That is zero because that's just a vector. And a really boring exercise in vector calculus would con convince you that that is in fact this, that is to say the magnetic field. That's quite a long story. And if we now substitute everything in, we actually have now the usual kinetic energy and the term that looks like the stern gerlach term that was actually necessary for there to be a spin. And so actually, um, well, uh, there are further corrections in here. You can go to second order in a slightly different perturbation theory, and then uh, you get the spin orbit coupling. Uh, once you make this a central potential, this becomes L. So you have S dot L. That's a uh, Darwin term. Uh, it's to do with the zeta bevegon electron effectively has a finite size. And that's the relativistic mass term. Electron effectively gets heavier as it gets faster. So actually we now uh, arrived at the fact that uhlenbeck goodsmith spin is the observable corresponding to sigma. But unlike Uhlenbeck and Goodsmith, we now know exactly where sigma is coming from. And so let's retrace our steps. We have the evidence of our own eyes that reality is causal, continuous, uniform, and isotropic. If we take causality and continuity, we get the general shape of the equation of motions, Schrodinger-like equations. If we use uniformity from translation group, we get the relationship between uh, energy and momentum in special relativity. Michelson Morley's experiment tells us that reality is also Lorentz invariant, and we knew it was isotropic. Once we plug that into group theory, we get the Lorentz group. We look at the invariance of the Lorentz group, we get that, and from Uhlenbeck and Goodsmith, we know that that's a half. All of this together, after a lot of boring mass, gets us Dirac's equation. After we eliminate the negative energies and go perturbative with respect to the velocity relative to the speed of light, we actually get the Zeeman effect. Right, to first order uh, in perturbation theory. And if we add the scalar potential and go to second order in perturbation theory, we also get the spin orbit coupling, relativistic mass term, Darwin term, and also something called angular magnetoelectric term. It is usually insignificant. So actually the conclusion from this is that Lorentz group has an angular momentum-like invariant and its rest frame part corresponds to what Uhlenbeck and Goodsmith have called spin. Uh, and actually spin has nothing to do with rotations as you can see, not directly. It makes an appearance because time is a degree of freedom in special relativity. It makes an appearance because we not just have the momenta, we also have boosts in Lorentz group. So it is essentially a four dimensional object where time is an essential degree of freedom. Uh, and then of course, any attempt to try and explain it in three dimensions is only going to lead to confusion. And you have seen all of that confusion on the internet. And so at that point, uh, I was quite satisfied. Uh, I thought, fine, uh, I probably now understand what is spin and where it comes from. It's a Lorentz group invariant, and it is so weird because it's not actually three-dimensional, it's four-dimensional space-time. And that's all I have to say. Uh, let me see if I can get uh, that uh, back, uh, stop sharing. So, um, questions? <laughs>
All right. Wow. It's a it's a very very interesting talk, and I it's almost like I would say like almost like enlightening. <laughs> Actually, I'm I'm a physicist by training, and it's good to see these things like like you know it's like a renaissance to me to see uh, all these like appearing. And also, I remember like as a physics student, I learned about all these Pauli matrices. I always wondered, hmm, how did he know all this? <laughs> but we've actually... lost uh, we've lost fifty participants. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they got scared off by the mathematics. <laughs> it's also a bit late, like in like in Europe. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um. Uh, as, I mean, like th there are some questions, but you know, this um, um, this is also actually actually like for this session, actually I would um, uh, actually I would encourage the participants to raise their hands to you know exchange ideas. Uh, actually, I've got quite a list here in Q and A. So yeah. anonymous attendee says, "Will these be details be in your upcoming book?" Uh, yes, maybe I will. Maybe like can can I allow like Len Mueller because he raised his hand and then like oh, so sure. Len ask his questions then other people can type and you know raise your hand. Hi Len, hey, uh, you can yourself to talk. Hi Ilya, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Great, thanks. Thanks for a wonderful presentation. So I had a question about going into the rotating frame and the approximations that are made. Um, so it looks like a two-level system, the way it's written. So the eigenvalues... Um, yes, positive and negative energies, not, not spin, of course, yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. But it, but it looks like a two-level system that you could get exact eigenvalues for and eigenvectors uh, or Correct. whatever. You can, you can solve Dirac's equation exactly for a hydrogen atom. Right. Yep, solutions exist. So, so my question is, um, Often in the spin physics related to magnetic resonance, we, saw, we find some interesting and unexpected properties when we consider the uh, vestiges of strong coupling when we usually assume weak coupling. And there's some interesting physics there. Um, I'm well, curious, that, are, is there anything analogous in these systems where there's you know, some uh, surprising and interesting physics that comes out? if you don't make the approximation of going into the rotating frame or said another way, dig into whatever the analogous block Seeger shifts might be? Well, actually the, the group that's investigating exactly this with the pur purpose of testing fundamental physics is Dima Butker's group in Mainz, of course. Uh, and yes, uh, they can put considerable constraints on parameters of many candidate models of by measuring with extremely high accuracy the um, the corresponding spin properties. So yes, you are right. Um, Dirac's equation, well, it is claimed in particular by Dirac that it is not extensible to multi-particle systems, but quantum chemists have found some serviceable approximations uh, to that end. Um, it's, uh, by, by the time we are talking about multi-particle systems, really, this is ill-suited. We need to go into full quantum field theory. Uh, and at that point, we are lucky if we can get a single proton calculated. This is really, really hard. So yes, you're right. Uh, yes, it's possible. Next to impossible to compute. Great. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Len, for your uh, question. So next, like, I also saw, like, so Fred, would you like to, Fred Peras, would you like to speak? Your question is very long. <laughs> Fred, you need to unmute yourself. Fred uh, Yep, no, okay. it's okay. You can just read the question. Uh, let me see. Where is it? Um, the first one. Uh, uh, suggested a pictorial model of spin rotating flow energy. Um, value in such models? No. Uh, they serve only to confuse. So these three-dimensional representations attempts a three-dimensional picture of what is substantially a space-time phenomenon, uh, it'll just get no end to confusion. Um, and yes, there may be some obscure mathematical isomorphisms that one can find and then visualize, uh, but uh, there's value in not losing track of physics. Um, uh, you know, Cartan particularly has um, muddied the water incredibly by, by creating abstract representations of these algebras that didn't connect directly to physics so yes, we can find an obscure isomorphism that then looks like a fancy picture, uh, but really it's uh, just a bunch um, of, of invariants of what of a group that we understand really well. Um, comprehend spin at a basic human level. Well, oh, we have to define comprehension, right? So it's um, uh, 
relating it to the reality around us and uh, our brain over the last uh, couple a uh, million uh, years since the monkeys hasn't really evolved to perceive four dimensional space time. So the brain is unfortunately ill adapted to perceiving these things. Uh, that having been said, I am against trying to visualize spin in three dimensions. Oh. All right, I, I mean, I'm just curious, like, because like, you know, for a lot of us, like who are chemists, you know, like, uh, in, in, so like all these details that you have, like, is it in your book? Is it published? And no, no. Uh, next Christmas, if I'm lucky, I mean, these things always take twice as long as you think, even if you take that into account. <laughs> because like, of all, all these symmetries, like, because like this is also like manifested in the Maxwell equations where you have like, the potentials and A. Yeah. Maybe I was just thinking like people would be able to understand this from the classical physics if you have, because like the same kind of finish. Okay. No, uh, trying to squeeze it into 3D will only confuse things. Uh, I think Art had a question. Um, yep. Just, just a very simple one, Ilya. That was really fantastic, by the way. Uh, but when one applies theory, of course, are hoping or expect on some physical grounds that the higher order terms aren't going to explode. How does one know uh, that in this case? Yeah, so in, in that case, this is known as regular approximation. Um, there's a perturbation series that you have to use it. Uh, Zora, uh, if you've ever used DFT packages, you would have come across that abbreviation. So it is the Zora approximation that gets all of these spin orbit coupling terms and so on. Uh, and, and that series is convergent, uh, assuming you are only weakly relativistic, uh, which is okay um, up to about lanthanides. And um, the atoms that are strongly relativistic, it obviously has problems with, but then um, entirely different category of things turn up um, in that the entire class of approximations to which Zora belongs uh, makes the assumption that the small component, the, the negative energy component of the spinner is small. Um, and in strongly relativistic limit, that's no longer the case. So the entire approximation scheme falls apart, uh, at which point one really needs to solve the full four component Dirac's equation uh, but then um, extra approximations uh, arrive to make uh, it work for multi-body systems. Uh, and all of these approximations, they tail off at one over C to the fourth. So, um, and actually that's the next order of accuracy. So if you go past uh, the relativistic mass, the Darwin and the spin orbit, the next order of accuracy is one over C to the fourth. And this is where uh, a great zoo of other assumptions and approximations kicks in. So yes, technically you could continue that series, but there will be a lot of other ghosts in that machine that probably make it not worthwhile. So at that point, one has to abandon approximations and go to four component relativity um, for things like uranium core electrons, for example. And when that stops working, then we have to go into quantum field theory. And so uh, what would, does this mean then, for example, scattering experiments suggest that the spin of the proton has a very large component from coupling together the spins of the gluons rather than the quarks? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, actually, that, that's a wonderful question because I have the exact answer for it. Uh, it was given to me by a specialist in a nuclear structure theory at, at the Euromar in Berlin. So uh, the lady gave a wonderful talk about nuclear structure and I thought, yeah, that's my chance to find out how exactly, uh, you know, the quarks are coupled inside the proton so that you get this spin and this effective uh, um, interaction uh, between them that then gives you effective magnetic gyric ratio. So I cornered her in the coffee room and I said, okay, I said, what happens inside the nucleus? Why do we have this effective magnetic gyric ratio? Uh, she looked at me and said, well, have mercy, man, uh, she said, not even the potential is currently known for the strong nuclear force. So <laughs> the exact answer to your question, Art, is nobody knows. So then we need you to give another lecture. Uh, well, so basically, as, as, as you know, right, for, for, for nuclear, we have an effective spin, right? It's, it's a combination 
of the spin uh, and the internal orbital angular momenta of the nucleons. And yes, nuclei can have excited states where they couple differently. And so those excited states would have different spins. Uh, but for chemistry, of course, we are always in the ground nuclear state. There's only one nucleus known uh, where the excited state is in the, in the ultraviolet somewhere. I don't remember what it is. Um, anyway, uh, the theory of nuclear structure is in a pretty bad shape. Um, it's not exact enough to get these quantities out. I think Christian, Christian Banks. Yeah, I, uh, I actually allow him to talk. Christian, you can ask your questions. Hey, Ilya. Um, I was wondering in your, in your talk, you basically, you um, decompose into those irreducible representations and you only considered one on the basis that it matches uh, experimental results. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, I mean, we are 100 years further. Mm -hmm. Is there any evidence that the other irreducible representations uh, oh, yes. play any role yeah. in physics? So there's a scalar representation when both J's are zero uh, and that's electromagnetic waves. Uh, right, there is um, a half-half representation um, that's um, Dirac's vector and I don't remember what it corresponds to. It's a certain class of pseudoparticles that you see in solid state physics. Then um, there is one zero, zero one representation. Those are bosons. Um, so um, everything that's not a fermion. Um, and uh, then uh, more exotic uh, irreducible representations are um, have been seen occasionally, but they are seen on these effective pseudoparticles like excitons and skirmions. Um, um, you know, on regular lattices, you can have this um, uh, whole excitation pairs that do obey those group theoretical properties. So yes, you are, and in fact, the principal candidates for the dark matter, uh, if it even exists, are, are some exotic irreducible representations of the fundamental symmetry groups that just don't couple to reality except gravitationally. So yes, you are right, uh, that stuff exists, but uh, every time I look at it, my eyes pop out. Uh, uh, I'm not, not, not strong enough to read that stuff. <laughs> All right, yeah, thanks a lot. Right, we have some questions. How are we doing on time, Kong? Um, <laughs> we've already been going on for one hour and 40 minutes. It's actually like, actually uh, I have to go soon. So it's up mm -hmm. to you. Would you like to continue and then I can make you a co-host and you can continue to host the session or we can also call it, you know. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's see if there's anything. Uh, yeah, if, let's just pick maybe one or two, one or two um, that you would like to uh, answer. Uh, that, um, uh, that there, there isn't uh, really anything else that cannot be Googled up. Uh, so I say recall to <laughs>